Good piece of legislation, and I support it. I call the Honourable Leanne Dalzell. Mr Speaker, uh, when the Minister commented on this uh, piece of legislation, he didn't mention that Clause 15 uh, was a Henry VIII clause. And I think it is important to kind of put on the record of the House uh, why there is an objection to, in principle, uh, Henry VIII clauses uh, being enacted. And the reason is simply this, that when an, an enactment needs to be amended, it should be done by Parliament. It should not be done by the executive. And when one has a Henry VIII clause in play, it actually enables the executive to make an amendment to the work of Parliament, uh, which, of course, in itself um, is something that shouldn't be um, taken lightly. Uh, and a, a, num a number of people have mentioned the Law Society submission on this particular piece of legislation, and they commented on the, uh, on the use of the Henry VIII clause. And they said that in this particular instance they didn't have an objection to it because it was the power to make technical amendments uh, to the enactments uh, that the legislation amends to ensure consistency across the statute book. And um, generally speaking, that, that, was an acceptable, uh, that was acceptable to the Law Society and I think acceptable right across the House. In terms of those minor amendments that would need to be made in order to ensure consistency, because when one is talking about the extent of reform uh, that the cr criminal procedure legislation was designed to address, it was entirely appropriate that some mechanism for those tidy ups um, outside the statute's amendment process uh, could be allowed. So, generally speaking, the principle was accepted that as long as it was within that category, uh, there wasn't a problem. But the Law Society pointed out that it could be um, problematic. And I wanted to particularly congratulate Graham Edgler, who appeared uh, on behalf of the Law Society, because obviously he personally had put a lot of effort into this particular submission. And I believe that he represented the Law Society's position exceptionally well. And uh, what he said when he appeared in front of us, and I, I have the um, submission in front of me, is that uh, he was concerned about uh, the insertion of a paragraph which would allow references to the word crime and other amendments to be enacted, um, to be amended by the executive. Now, again, where that was a technical issue, he didn't have a problem. But what uh, the Law Society, in fact, identified that what could happen was that there could be, by amendment, to, by regulation, you could have vastly expand the scope of certain offences and, in fact, result in criminalising conduct that would have been entirely lawful but for that amendment. And, of course, he made the point, quite rightly so, that these sorts of policy decisions are questions Parliament itself uh, should consider. And I, I actually believe that when we, when we heard the submission, um, we were kind of, we, we did question him about this, and I think that uh, what he really persuaded the select committee to was that we had to rethink about what the essence of the amendment was all about. And what he was concerned about, and the Law Society was concerned about, was that under the law applying before the Principal Act um, enters into force, the concept of a crime for the purposes of the criminal law is essentially a subset of imprisonable offences. It included all offences where the prosecution has the option of laying a charge in there are a no substantial number of imprisonable offences that do not meet the definition of crime as the prosecution is not permitted to lay them indictably. So this is um, a natural consequence of the change um, to the uh, legislation itself. Then he went on to say that this bill itself makes a number of amendments to the term crime and provides good examples of the type of amendment that are technical compared with those that involve important policy policy questions. Then he says, Schedule 2 lists a number of amendments to, to uses of the word crime in the Crimes Act 1961. The amendments are simple amendments that enable the law to be intelligible now that the definition of crime has been repealed and the distinction between summary and indictable matters removed. The amendments to the other sections are different 
while they may be the right course, they involve a policy choice that extends the scope of criminal offences beyond that which applies today. The choice of what replaces crime in these situations determines how much the reach of these offences is extended. And then he goes on to talk about, for example, um, the offences in the sections listed above tend to criminalise innocuous or not very serious behaviour when it is committed with the intent to commit a crime. So, you, uh, for example, criminalises um, section 2512 of the Crimes Act, criminalises possession of computer software that is capable of, an, of enabling unauthorised access to a computer. However, this possession is only I illegal if done with the intent to commit a crime. So he was making the point that um, the, the uh, situation of removing the reference to the word crime would in fact potentially create uh, a criminal offence that was no longer, that was not the original intention because it was um, not done with the intent to commit a crime. Um, and then he used uh, a number of other examples, but the best example he used was burglary. Burglary involves an unauthorised entry to a building um, with intent to commit a crime. An unauthorised entry by itself um, is illegal but is not considered to be particularly serious. However, if the entry is done with the intention of committing a crime, it becomes a burglary. So even though he went through all of the technical details in the way that he did, the point that he made was absolutely correct. And what we were actually going to be doing was creating the potential for, um, for uh, offences that would not of themselves be regarded to be serious crimes, they would become serious crimes by the removal of the word crime um, in the legislation. And uh, we had a good, robust conversation with officials about this, and I have to say that the officials that uh, were serving our committee were um, very, very helpful, um, and they actually came back to us with a very simple solution to the problem and that was to remove the reference um, to paragraph H altogether. And that, I think, was um, incredibly helpful because what it enabled us to do was to um, address a very serious issue um, that may never have become a problem, but the fact that it could have and that our select committee had been given the benefit of that advice, I actually think that we did the right thing. So um, I do agree with the chair of the select committee that we were incredibly well served by our officials and we were able to um, make the change that we did. And I, I think I just want to agree with what my colleague um, Andrew Little said before, and that is, is that sometimes when you're faced with legislation at a select committee, even if it looks pretty straightforward on the face of it, um, sometimes it just takes one submission. There were only two submissions that we received on this entire bill. Sometimes it just takes one submission and somebody to come to the select committee and make the case that you can end up making a quite a substantial change to the legislation, which means that you don't get into problems down the track. And I think what Andrew Little was saying was that actually we do have to allow time for um, bills to go to select committees for those that are going to make those submissions to take the time to consider all of the elements of the legislation and enable them to make constructive comments um, as the Law Society did in this particular case and to enable that to be considered by officials and for a select committee to report back. And sometimes I think that it's, um, we actually do a disservice to the very robust process that we have by referring out to the public for that, um, for that wider reach and consideration um, on legislation. We do, we do the people of New Zealand a great disservice if we do not allow sufficient time for that. I think that what we've seen um, here tonight in the House with other bills that aren't being allowed sufficient time at select committee, that we will pay a price for that in the long term. And this is a very simple piece of legislation, but it just shows what a difference one submission uh, can make. And the other example that uh, my colleague um, Andrew Little used was the 
family court proceedings legislation uh, where we haven't had sufficient time and with a looming deadline of the legislation coming into force um, in part on the 1st of October this year, um, I, just, I just despair of the um, reality of people that have to operate within a time frame that hasn't been given sufficient time. So on this particular instance, I would really like to place on record my um, sincere thanks to the New Zealand Law Society. They have done this House proud. I call the Honourable Member David Clendon. Tenakwe.